Thank you everyone for your kind attention. We shall now officially commence this track, Sustainable Financing of Cities, A New Normal. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honour to now introduce our esteemed speakers and moderator who will form the panel for this track on the Sustainable Financing of Cities, A New Normal. Please welcome our moderator, Professor Greg Clark, Global Advisor on Net Zero Cities and Sustainable Investment, as well as Chair of the UK Cities Climate Investment Commission. Also, a very warm welcome to our panellists, Mr. Johanna Varatiainen, Mayor of Helsinki, Ms. Isabel Chatterton, Regional Industry Director, Infrastructure and Natural Resources, Asia and Pacific of the International Finance Corporation, His Excellency Nguyen Parot, Vice Governor of Phnom Penh, Mr. Desmond Quack, Head of Sustainable Finance APEC, Global Head of Sustainable Finance Group, Chairman of Optimist Foundation Singapore UBS, and Mr. Jean Fang, Associate Managing Director of Moody's Investors Service. We also have Dr. Ma Jun, President of the Institute of Finance and Sustainability, Adjunct Professor of Peking University, and Co-Chairman for ISO Standard on Sustainable Finance, who will be sharing his views virtually through a pre-recorded address. Without further ado, I will now pass the time to our moderator, Professor Greg Clark. Prof Greg, over to you. Great. Well, Karis, thank you very much indeed. Good afternoon, everyone. Can I hear a round of applause for our esteemed panel, please? So thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. And um, it's great to be here to discuss this very important topic. And the challenge that we're talking about is this. We know that cities are central to tackling climate change and to thinking about the future of the planet because cities are concentrations of people, systems, assets, and of course, they're concentrations of economic activity. We know that cities, of course, are vulnerable to climate change and to planetary change, particularly vulnerable to environmental shocks, flooding, heating, and so much more. And cities are also the places where the innovations that are required for the transition to net zero have to happen. If you like, the net zero pathway is a combination of the energy switch and the urban transition. So what is the urban transition? Now, all of these things require investment. And the challenge is this. The level of investment required to decarbonize our cities is much greater than the amount of capital that city governments themselves control. So this is the conundrum. How do we generate the capital required to make the investment in the transition that's needed, given that cities do not control enough capital to do all of the work on their own? This is the central question that we will pay attention to during this panel. And we're in that moment where the private sector in particular has introduced the concept of sustainable finance, the idea that finance is no longer, as it were, just a passive ingredient in the transition towards a net zero economy and society, but that finance can be an active ingredient, bringing with it incentives, bringing with it behavior change, bringing with it new business models, new financial models. In other words, finance is going to be a creative element of this transition towards sustainable cities if we follow this idea about sustainable finance, which we're going to discuss. So the big question then is this. If sustainable finance is real, will cities be able to use it in order to tackle that gap between the investment required and the amount of capital they control? And our distinguished panel are going to illuminate this point. Now, during the panel, we're going to be using the Slido app. I want to firstly tell you that uh, in the app right now, there are a series of uh, polls that I've introduced. Um, one of the polls is already experiencing some votes. I would like to invite you to vote in that poll. The first poll question is just asking you, is there an investment gap in the sustainability of cities? And uh, after you've answered that one, I'll carry on and ask a few more polls as we go along. Now, as you've already heard, we have a very distinguished panel, and I want to immediately 
bring them to the conversation. And the way this will work is I'm going to ask all of them the same first question, which is what is the financing gap that cities face in becoming more sustainable and how can it be closed? They'll all answer this from their own perspective. And then we'll get into a debate and a discussion asking each of the panelists different questions. And your questions are more important than my questions. So please use the Slido app to send your questions in and to prioritize and vote for the questions that other people have asked. I hope that's clear. We're looking forward to a really good discussion. And Mr. Mayor, if we may, we're going to begin with you. So in your opinion, what is the financing gap that cities face in becoming more sustainable? And how can it be closed? Give us the perspective as the mayor of Helsinki. Well, Greg, I cannot avoid taking, assuming the perspective of an economist, which, which I am, and then taking a very top-down approach on this. I believe we don't know if there is a, whether there is a gap, but investment that is profitable enough with a sound return will be carried out. And that is still the, the main function of financial markets. And I'm a bit concerned that this talk of, of uh, sustainable finance le might lead in the European Union, for example, to an over-politicization of investment, which will then lead to a less efficient allocation of resources, which will make us all poorer. Uh, so that the, the real mechanism to, to uh, deal with climate change is not taking a political grip of investment. Instead, it, it's based on expectations. So we should all think and understand that expectations are our friend. If we create expectations of a future market, future planet, where uh, non-climate non friendly investments will just not be profitable, then every investor will take into this into account and start directing their investment decisions towards climate friendly purposes. So the real return or the real positive effect of this talk on, on uh, sustainable finance is, so I believe, via exp expectations. And I'm a bit doubtful about us politicians trying to steer investment. This will lead to less efficient allocation of resources. So this was well, my sort of top-down economist view, but I cannot do any better being even being a mayor, but I cannot stop being the economist. Thank you, Greg. Well, <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. It's, it's good to have what I would call intelligent skepticism uh, in the panel. And I think what you've said, to be really clear, is that you're all in favor of capital being invested in tackling climate change, you're just not sure if creating a special category called sustainable finance is the way to do it. Is that fair? That's, that's fair. Sure. Great. Okay, well, let's go to the International Finance Corporation. Isabel, great to have you here on the panel. Thank you very much for joining us. What's your view on this key question? Is there a financing gap that cities face in becoming more sustainable and how can it be closed? Um, so in our view, there is indeed a financing gap uh, because city mayors need to maintain the growth momentum. They have to reduce poverty and take care of the, the, the classes that are less privileged. And they also need to do their bid for climate change. We all know that, as we heard in the morning, the majority of emissions, 70 or 75 percent, globally come from urban cities. And the world is urbanizing even more. Um, we know that 1.7 trillion per year is needed annually between now and 2030 to address the, the needs of cities in, in developing Asia. We did a study called Green Reboot um, that takes the needs of 21 uh, emerging country cities, six of which are in Asia, um, in terms of needs for climate change to address the post-COVID um, rebalancing act and we found that to address all these needs, these cities potentially could, could attract as much as seven trillion worth of investment and they could create over 140 million of jobs. So we do think that 
if we don't intend to stay business as usual. As a matter of fact, if we want to do our bit at the city level and make sure that we contribute to tackling climate change, the investment needs are great and the, the gap needs to be filled. You ask how we could fill the gap. There has never been a shortage of money. And I can tell you for a fact that there is a lot of funding out there constantly looking for projects and everybody's much, very much interested in city projects. We ourselves have financed 310 city associated projects over the last 15 years across many countries. The need is there, but they're not sufficient projects. There are 200, over 200 trillion worth of assets being managed by pension funds, insurance companies, non-banking financial institutions. The problem is they're not really going where they are needed the most. Mm. Um, so the capital is out there, the need at the level of city governments is out there. We just need to make sure that somebody comes and stitch it all together to make it happen. Great. Isabel, thank you very much. So just to summarize what I think you've said, there's a big flow of capital out there, but it's not necessarily reaching the right projects. And so you're in favor of some kinds of interventions or activities that enable the capital to reach a broader set of projects, perhaps a wider range of cities, a different set of initiatives from the ones that the market will do on its own. Is that right? That's right. Of course, we all need to be extraordinarily careful of over intervention, right? Mm. Um, I'm a firm believer of letting market forces play. And I'm also an economist by training as well. Um, but, you know, cities today have many roles. They are owner of assets, they are providers of services, they are regulators. Um, so in that role, I do think that they can steer somewhat the places where investment would give the highest impact in terms of return to the citizens. Um, to give you an example, the nationally determined contributions as part of each individual country's COP26 agenda clearly need governments to set out those transition paths. They clearly need to um, signal to investors and to the market that there is actually a plan behind those nationally determined contributions to help us all get there. So we as investors would of course look at the different plans by different governments. We would look at the sectors within sectors plans, understand whether that's gonna be achievable. So to some extent, it's, it's a softer, mm -hmm way of intervention, what, yes. what I think is needed, is more of a directing role rather than what you could, you know, could be deemed as, as um, a distorting role, yes. just, just to be clear. Yes, I think what you're describing is a market making role, not, not a market distorting role, and I'm sure we'll come back to that. Um, just before we bring in the vice governor, thank you to the 57 of you who've participated already in the poll. Um, if more of you would like to come in, you've got another minute or two on this question before we switch to the next question. So far, 100% of you say, yes, there is a financing gap for cities in becoming more sustainable. Vice Governor, great privilege to have you here. Thank you for joining us. From the perspective of Phnom Penh, is there a financing gap and what is needed to close it? Thank you, Greg. Thank you all to have me here. I think that each, each city might have different priorities. And for Phnom Penh City, although we are the city of the low carbon emission country, but we have made a lot of effort to, to fight against the climate change. We have updated our master plan to respond to the climate change. We have created a mechanism to follow up we have taken actions from small to, to big to fight uh, the climate change. And we still have a lot of, um, I think that the challenge that could also relate to your question about the financial gap. We are not really the part in the national adaptation plan. Uh, I think that it is the um, national level, but for the city level, as you just mentioned, and the mayor just mentioned that we play a very important role. We have allocated some of our budget to fight against climate change, but our investment capital is still very, uh, very limited. And we could not take the loan as a city. 
we need to go to the central government. And one of the questions that we need to answer uh, to those projects is about the cost recovery. So because we are still the developing country, so cost re recovery is still a high priority for us. Second uh, challenge is that we, we are facing is the uh, private investment. They are also looking for the high return of their investment. Third challenges, I think that, that also uh, create the uh, financial uh, gap is that uh, the, lack, the limited access to information and access to the, to the funding. Uh, like uh, from IFC, she, she just explained and Greg just uh, echoed that there are a lot of funds available, but uh, we as a city uh, of the developing country sometimes, we have very limited access to those funds and also we have limited access to the information uh, mm -hmm. available for us. And the last point, I think that uh, the lack of skill and um, um, capacity building that we need to build capacity for for the uh, for our uh, official or our staff at the at the sub national level. So we need human resource and skill to prepare a good uh, project, uh, especially the bankable bankable project to meet the requirement of the uh, financial institution uh, like the IFC or other bank. So uh, these are the the challenge that I. I would like to share, and I think that uh, I have two points you would like to raise before that uh, to fill the gap. Now, first, I think that we should have the platform, not only one, but a lot of platform to share information uh, to the city's level and also uh, to give the opportunity like this platform that the city could meet the banker uh, and also the uh, financial institu institution and others company uh, who are interested in the sector. And uh, secondly, uh, I believe that the international financial institution need to provide a lot of a lot of grants for the cities of the developing country to start their their own project toward the sustainable financing. So there should be the beginning. So we cannot jump on the uh, at the end of the road. There should be a beginning of the road. We are not like the mayor of Helsinki, his economist, and he represents the city of developed country. But for us, we, as a city of the de developing country, we need to start, and sometimes need to start uh, from scratch in, in uh, the, some of the area of fighting against climate change because we have different priorities sometimes. Thank mm. you very much. Well, thank you very much, Vice Governor. What you've said is actually very, very clear. You said that there's there's an apparent dilemma for you between pursuing the recovery from COVID and your broad development goals versus finding extra money, as it were, in a, in a tight resource environment for tackling climate change. And this is a very, very challenging kind of conflict you have. And you've also made the point that resources are very low anyway. And you want to see a platform for sharing and learning. And you want access to some of these wider schemes. And uh, absolutely right. Um, Audience, thank you. 61 of you have participated in the poll. 98 say yes, 2%, 98% say yes, 2% say no. The 2% who said no, just send me your phone numbers and your email address and I'll, I'll send you some information. I'm, I'm only joking. Uh, before we hear from uh, our distinguished guests from UBS and Moody's, we're gonna hear from Dr. Ma Jung, who has kindly um, videoed his answer to our core question. Are we ready to play? Dr. Ma's uh, video now. Can we hear that, please? Yes, thank you very much. So let's hear from Dr. Ma Jung. And as you heard earlier, he's the president of the Institute of Finance and Sustainability and the co-chairman for the ISO standard on sustainable finance in China. Let's have Dr. Ma. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, let me thank the uh, Center for Livable Cities Singapore for inviting me to this important event. I would like to say a few words on the financing gap that Chinese cities are facing in becoming more sustainable and how it can be closed. Back two years ago, China announced its goal of carbon peaking by 2030 and carbon neutrality by 2060, and is now formulating a one plus M policy framework to decarbonize the different industries. These goals will also need to translate into cities. 
it's important to recognize that uh, the diversity of Chinese cities in terms of levels of development, industrial structure, and natural resources, and proactively plan for an orderly climate transition instead of expecting all cities to reach carbon neutrality at the same time. Cities should develop differentiated pathways and strategies of decarbonization. Those with abundant renewable energy, broad forestry coverage, or lighter industrial structure should be the first batch in the race to net zero. Others that are more reliant on heavy industries should explore ways to encourage steady and just transition of carbon intensive sectors which will require significant coordination among government agencies. Apart from these industries, sustainability should also be embedded in other aspects of city life, in urban infrastructure, such as district heating or cooling, green transportation, and green buildings. A more sustainable lifestyle of individuals may also be enabled through green consumption of food, clothing, and other daily items. Green finance, despite its rapid growth in recent years, has a bigger role to play to support a city's transformation towards carbon neutrality. Take Chongqing municipality as an example. It's one of the industrial bases of China and concentrated on heavy industries such as automobile, steel, and aluminum. It takes up around 2.5% of the national GDP about two years ago, I led a research team and helped Chongqing to formulate a green finance roadmap for carbon neutrality. Our research estimated that in the coming 30 years, Chongqing will need 15 trillion RMB for green and low carbon investments. How to mobilize private capital for the sustainable transition of cities? Here are some lessons and experiences from Chinese cities that have done a lot of experimentation on green finance, including Chongqing. The first is to develop a roadmap for decarbonizing the entire city, including action plans for its energy, transportation, building, and manufacturing sectors. The second is to come up with a list of specific green and low carbon projects, put them into a project database, and upload them onto a platform that's linked to the financial institutions. In China, many cities have developed a such project database and financing platform, which can effectively match financial resources to green projects. The third is to provide policy incentives for private financing for green projects. Some green finance pilot region, including Hujo, have provided significant interest subsidies for green loans. For example, uh, in Hujo, they provide three levels of interest subsidies, 12%, 9%, and 6%. For very green or dark green projects, they provide 12%. For green ones, they provide 9%. And for light green ones, they provide 6%. But 12%, we mean that the, uh, if the original interest rate is 5, and you multiply by 0 0.12, uh, that's a 60 basis points to be paid by the local government. And because of the interest subsidies, Hujo's green loans and green bond issuance have grown very fast in the past few years at the annual average rate of about 40%. And they still uh, are able to keep the NPL ratio below 0.4%. So it's indeed becoming a very important boost for the city's green development and uh, uh, its entire economic growth. The fourth is to develop and utilize a suite of green financial products. Green loans and green bonds may be the low-hanging fruits, but a lot more can be done, including the use of green insurance, green funds, green IPOs, uh, ABS, PVC funds, and carbon-related products. Transition finance, on the other hand, can also become an important tool for decarbonizing the high-emitting industries. Conscious of time, I would pause here and let me thank the organizer once again for having me, and I wish today's event a great success. Thank you. Let's give a round of applause to Dr. Ma, if we may. So uh, Dr. Ma's uh, example from Chinese City is very interesting. He said four things are needed, a roadmap for decarbonization, specific projects that are, are going to deliver that roadmap, 
uh, the utilization of green finance overall as a strategy with incentives, and then a range of financial tools for different kinds of challenges and initiatives. Very, very interesting. Let's go to um, UBS. And firstly, uh, let Desmond, let's say thank you very much for a wonderful lunch and for uh, the entertainment as well as the spectacular investment that you're making in that connection between art and sustainability. And I think we should give UBS a round of applause if we may. So thank you. Most welcome. Um, it's the same question for you, if I may. Um, is there a financing gap? And if there is, how do we close it? Well, thank, thank you very much, Greg, uh, for inviting me to be on this panel and to represent UBS, uh, to represent some of our views. I would say that according to the World Bank's estimates, about $93 trillion is needed between now and 2030 in order to support the kind of uh, sustainable infrastructure development in uh, public transport, in energy, in waste, in water. And... Uh, with that kind of phenomenal amount of capital that's needed to do all of this, particularly in developing uh, countries, uh, clearly there is a financing gap. And some of that financing gap that we're seeing uh, comes from various factors. Some of it has got to do with credit worthiness. Some of it has got to do with the bankability of the program. Uh, and obviously, there are challenges in attracting private finance to support uh, some of these initiatives. Uh, to overcome these gaps, uh, we're already seeing that many cities have uh, developed ideas uh, around perhaps public-private uh, structuring, and some of that can allow a little bit more leverage to be placed so that programs become a little bit more bankable with uh, private investors. Uh, Cities, governments have also uh, explored the area of targeted taxes and incentives that uh, focus perhaps on low carbon uh, initiatives uh, as opposed to some of the more traditional high carbon fossil fuel type uh, sources. And I would say that a third area which has been uh, interesting for cities is in debt uh, financing instruments such as green bonds. Uh, as well as sustainability-linked loans and bonds, which have become uh, much more interesting recently. And I think some of these uh, allow for long-term debt to be structured. Some of them ultra-long, I would say. Mm. Uh, and this can be done in such a way as to allow for uh, some of this debt and loan to be structured with much more stable pricing that goes out into the long future. Mm. And that allows cities then to take on that kind of infrastructure development with a little bit more confidence. Mm. Well, Desmond, thank you very much indeed. You've really covered the gamut there. You've introduced the concept of blended finance, public and private capital working together. And you've talked about the importance of using the full range, as it were, of uh, sustainable finance tools. We'll come back to some of those in a minute. But you've highlighted the characteristic of sustainable finance, long-term, targeted, very much focused on fixed pricing, so risk reduction, and focused very much on incentivizing the transition. So very, very helpful. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you to those of you who've spotted that there's already another poll going on. 15 of you have already voted. We're asking you what explains this financing gap. And uh, at the moment, you're saying it's a lack of mature markets for investment, 40% of the votes are there. 27% of you are saying it's a lack of bankable and investable projects. 20% uh, are saying it's a lack of skills and knowledge and information in the marketplace. Very interesting, picking up the point that uh, Isabel was making. 10% uh, of you say it's a lack of public finance at the moment. 0% of you think it's a lack of private finance. So that's a very uh, interesting point. Now, Gene, I'm sorry we've left you till last. We won't do this every time we speak. But Moody's is, of course, a unique and very esteemed organization in this space as you report so widely on what you believe not just to be the credit worthiness of individual entities and balance sheets, but also the performance of the whole financial system. So in your view, when you think about cities and you think about sustainability, do you observe a financing gap? And if so, what do you think is required to close it? Sure. Thank you, Greg, for the question. 
Um, I think we'd also start with a top-down view of how big the financing gap is. And I think Desmond's numbers are, are very much around where we think that the gap is. If you look at um, UN or uh, ADB estimates, the need for investment in sustainable infrastructure is probably around 3 to $4 trillion per year, of which we estimate about a quarter of that is being met. So the gap is indeed quite large. Um, I think it's also interesting to look at the way in which, you know, although there has been significant progress in meeting that gap through growing the sustainable finance market, there still is um, a clear imbalance, I think, in where that progress is being met. Uh, we looked at some data for um, green, sustainable, and sustainability-linked bonds being issued by cities and municipalities in 2021, which was a peak year for uh, issuance volume. And we saw that uh, in 2021, about 60% of that issuance was coming from North American cities, mm. about 33% from Europe, and only you know, less than 10%, about 8% or so from Asia PAC, which is you know, quite interesting when you consider the fact that you know, over 50% of the world's urban population actually resides in Asia. So there's also an opportunity, I would say, to sort of look at some of the imbalances in where that progress is being met. Um, in terms of how to fill the sustainability uh, finance gap, I think that the, I would agree with Isabel's comment that it comes down to information. And from a Moody's perspective, it means kind of bringing issuers and investors together to better understand ESG risks. And I would say that we're trying to do that at Moody's in a couple different ways. Firstly, in terms of our traditional credit ratings, we've been rolling out what we call ESG issuer profile scores. So you could look at the credit rating of any city or national government that we rate, you would see the credit rating, and you would also see on a scale of one to five, the degree to which environmental, social, or governance factors can potentially impact the credit. So we're trying to make investors a little bit more aware on um, you know, uh, the, the uh, links between ESG and, and credit quality. And at the same time, we're also working on a suite of new products that um, help investors make better decisions around um, ESG issues, such as um, second party opinions on green finance, sustainable uh, bonds, as well as a new suite of products to help investors better understand the impact of climate change. So, you know, it's, it's really through kind of improving data availability and assessments around ESG risks that, uh, that we hope that uh, we're, we're trying to close that gap in terms of sustainable finance. Gene, thank you very much. You're describing something that's quite dynamic, actually, here, aren't you? You're saying, on the one hand, that ESG criteria are becoming increasingly important in how you view, as it were, the credit worthiness of, of entities, but they're also becoming very important in, uh, in the ability of institutions to attract finance themselves to then on lend. So ESG is affecting both the issuer and the borrower, if I can use that language. But you're also saying climate change itself is changing the risk profile of all of the things that, that people are investing in. So it must be a very rich and busy time for you and your team. Is that fair? Absolutely. I mean, I think um, uh, I, I wouldn't say that we're just now looking at ESG factors. I mean, I think yeah. those have been driving credit in the background for a long time. I mean, um, governance, for example, has been an integral part of our, uh, our ratings methodology for countries and cities for a long time. Maybe we called it institutional strength or institutional framework, but essentially it's about the principles of governance. Um, and we've also been very focused on um, the way in which um, aging demographics, which we consider a social issue, or um, the, the higher volatility in terms of uh, climate results and, and the impact that may have on economic outcomes, that's been something we've looked at for quite some time. But I think what we're trying to do now through ESG IPS scores is just become more and more transparent in helping the market understand how we think uh, those connections exist between you know, actual uh, credit, uh, credit worthiness and uh, underlying issues that are, that are ESG driven. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Now, in a minute, I'm going to see if any of the panelists want to comment on anything that anybody else said. Uh, then I'm going to ask them one more question, each of my own, and then we're going to come to your questions. You've already sent me six questions. That's very wonderful. Please send some more questions because we want to use yours. Our most recent poll, 50 of you, or 50 of you have voted. 42% said the reason for the financing gap is the lack of a mature market. 
in sustainable investment. 34% said it's lack of bankable and investment-ready projects. 14% said it's a lack of skills, knowledge, and information. So that's very, very interesting. I'm going to open another poll now. We look forward to your thoughts about the next one, which is how can the gap be closed? And we'll, we'll come back to that. So um, one more question each from me, and then we'll get to our delegates' questions. And, and if we may, um, I'm going to start with you, Desmond, because um, you are uh, uh, at UBS, you're a world leader in providing sustainable finance. So can you just tell us a little bit more about which sustainable finance tools you think are potentially most useful for cities in their transition? And, you know, which tools for which activities, if you like? You're, you're our professor for a couple of minutes. Um, well, I would say any kind of sustainable finance instrument is useful today. Given the fact that we've got such a big financing gap, we're looking for all kinds of innovations that can get us to try and close this gap. So there are a number of ideas, the green bonds, green loans. These are obvious uh, uh, instruments that can be used uh, to try and push towards climate and social agenda. There is this whole thing around sustainability linked uh, bonds and loans, which have been useful because they've been able to allow uh, stakeholders to structure something around an ESG-defined set of KPIs mm. and outcomes that then allows for the raising of a larger pool of capital that can be applied uh, to the city's uh, development. And I think an emerging space is this whole area around supply chain finance. Right? Supply chain finance because we all recognize that in order to get to net zero with scope one, two, and three uh, kinds of commitments, one needs to think about that whole vendor and value chain uh, as part of that entire ecosystem that needs to be brought along in order for everybody in, in, in that stakeholder group to reach net zero together. But I guess some of the stuff that UBS has been uh, rather interested to play around with has also been uh, uh, in recent times around blended finance. And I think you were talking a little bit about uh, uh, this space, blended finance, and what we loosely call development impact bond. Mm. And I think these are in interesting instruments. I would say the development impact bond, obviously, actually is not quite a bond. It's actually just a social contract, really, with, uh, uh, with parties that allow us to construct something that has a defined set of outcomes, which then allows uh, for the value chain to kick in and for beneficiaries to, uh, to, to be able to uh, engage in that space and to, to benefit, and then for the investor to have uh, their payout in that sense, or their dividend in terms of the kinds of returns they're looking for. And UBS, in recent years, we were the first to bring in something in India. We, we had a development impact bond that, supported 700 schools, about 200,000 students, uh, and the outcome isn't quite uh, defined as the number of students who are reached, but uh, what is the kind of educational gain? What's the kind of literacy, numeracy uh, standards which are enhanced? Mm. And if that is met, then that whole development impact bond structure kicks in in a mm. positive way. Another example which uh, we'd done was also in India, where we supported um, uh, some of these maternal and child health programs. And we were especially excited with the results of that because some, we last count, counted 300,000 uh, mothers and newborns benefited from the fact that clinics in India raised their best practices to meet national standards uh, through such a development impact bond. Mm. But that's a, very different, that's a very different kind of innovation from perhaps the other one which we just mentioned, which is blended finance, which allows for philanthropic capital, government funds to be perhaps worked alongside with private capital and an investment tranche. And that brings investors with different risk return profiles and appetites to 
together alongside so that their social, environmental, as well as financial returns and objectives can be met by such a structure. Mm -hmm. And we just recently did something with an SDG outcomes fund, which allowed for a certain percentage to be philanthropic capital and the rest of it in private investments. And by commingling it this way with a certain first loss uh, structures and mechanisms put in place, it has made it a lot more palatable to draw private finance into this whole game. Great. Thank you very much for this detailed but really, really helpful answer. So you talked about green bonds, ESG-linked loans, SDG-linked loans and other finance, supply chain finance, blended finance and impact bonds. And you said in their own way, each of these tools is potentially useful for cities. They're so helpful. Very, very helpful. Now, colleagues, before we move on, is there anything that somebody else on the panel has said that you either want to enthusiastically agree with or respectfully disagree with? Mr. Mayor. Well, um, two points. The first one is, is the, the fact that the climate change is a global issue, so we need more investment everywhere. And... <laughs> Whereas a small economy or a city can think of investing more because of this climate change without, without uh, uh, less consumption, on the global level that cannot be so. So if we, as the global economy, want to invest more because of the climate challenge, as we must, then we must inevitably cut down consumption as well. And this is something that we, we must keep in mind. If there were just one government in the world, then he or she, the prime minister, would have to tell the world population, now you will all become a bit poorer under the, under the next decades to come. And this is a far more difficult message. And this is why I am emphasizing this basic idea that instead of trying to, to create a well-developed market for sustainable investment, we should aim at making the entire financial market sustainable, creating the, and by creating the incentives to do that. And this is precisely, this goes via expectations and, and the, the risk assessment that Jean was talking about. This is part of the same package. If, if the investor deems that the the combustion engine car will not will be hit by hard environmental taxes in the future then those investments will be cut down the same for coal plants the risk for investing in coal plants will just be so high that the rational investor average rational investor anywhere on the planet will invest in something else. So this is why I'm trying to emphasize the idea of not trying to create a separate market, but making the entire financial market responsible. And there, lest you, lest you interpret my, my comment here as cynical, which I'm not at all, urbanization is a great alley. This is the gold mine of today, because it is far easier to implement environmentally friendly solutions in cities and by building bigger cities we create value. So this is by urbanizing, by growing your cities, you are an ally of climate friendly sustainable policies anyway. And this is why cities and we mayors, even we mayors, we poor political decision makers are so important. Urbanization is the gold mine of today and that is the positive message that we cities can emit to, to the entire planet. Thanks. Well, thank you, Mr. I mean, I'm fascinated by what you've just said. There's, there's three bits in it that are really interesting. One is the, the fact that, you know, sustainable finance can't be a competitive thing that happens in some markets and not others because it's the future of the planet that really matters. Your second one is the one about mainstreaming. And you talked about frugality as well, the, the need for frugality. But the third one, and I think a very important message for this audience, is that urbanization is the route. Good urbanization is the route to decarbonization. It's not de-urbanization that's going to produce that. Now, who else wants to agree or disagree? Isabel. Um, who are just, you agreeing or disagreeing with, by the way? I want to compliment, not, <laughs> not necessarily agree or disagree. I just wanted to make the point that we could use all sorts of labels for financing, right? I mean, as Desmond quoted, there there's a long list, there's also green and super green, etc. 
Um, but if we take a step back, it's really about um, leveraging scarce public resources mm. uh, to try to meet the needs of citizens. Um, and that needs to be done in a prudent way. The reality today is that many subnational governments and many cities do not have the ability to borrow independently <coughs> from the central government. And there are many reasons why that is so. And we need to respect those reasons. So the point that I wanted to add is that if a national government is able to set out a prudent framework for subnational borrowing that enables the cities and the local municipalities to take increased accountability and responsibility for their finances, then that is a very good way to go. So therefore, financing, whether it's sustainability linked or not, um, it becomes one of the aspects for them to manage wisely the public resource. It's all about a po a, you know, proper public administration, public sector management, the whole relationship, intergovernmental fiscal relationship, between the different levels of government. So I just wanted to make sure that I, you know, we're not advocating for a gate opening of all sorts of financing without measure. What we, I think we're all advocating is that if there is a well-structured, prudent borrowing framework at the national level that enables the cities and the subnationals to take increasing responsibility and accountability in a prudent way, then in that case, it is wise to try to leverage the, the balance sheet of the cities through borrow. Thank you very much. This is a very good restatement of the case, yes, that you're trying to build a, a mature, prudent market here. You're not trying to distort a market. This, by the way, could be a lovely debate if we uh, wanted to make it really uh, central. Gene, you had your hand up, and then we'll come to the vice governor. Yeah, I, I think just to build on some of the points that the, the mayor made, which are, I think are quite excellent, uh, we're already, I think, I would argue, beginning to see some move towards a market where, you know, ESG risks are increasingly recognized and at one point will be priced into some, to some degree. When we look at um, hydrocarbon producers, whether they are, you know, economies that rely on hydrocarbons or whether they are, you know, companies that are heavily reliant on the hydrocarbon industry, we do think about it from a credit perspective and say, okay, what is the long-term strategy? either for this economy or for this company, given that there are you know, regulations coming into play, other restrictions that are going to impact their ability to operate, right? And that becomes a very real uh, factor that we think about in the credit, and it could have potentially downward pressure on credit, um, you know, raising financing costs. Um, and even when there isn't you know, outright regulatory um, frameworks in place, you know, obviously, uh, Governments in particular who are challenged with having to manage some of the impacts of climate change, for example, those are real fiscal costs, right? And so, you know, the degree to which governments are planning for that and trying to factor that into their long-term um, fiscal outlook uh, has a direct impact on how we think about their, their creditworthiness and ultimately, you know, the, the cost of funding for them. So in other words, you're making judgments or seeking to make intelligent judgments about how sustainable the fiscal and economic policies are of the governments themselves, and that then feeds back into their credit rating. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. great. Now, we're going to come to you, Vice Governor, but I'm just going to mention the most recent poll. Thank you for voting. 80% of you, 78%, in fact, said that what is needed to close the gap is the use of development finance and blended finance tools for cities, and then the rest of the answers were spread amongst the others. 80% of you think that. Vice Governor, did you want to agree or disagree with someone? I want to agree on the last point that my uh, colleague Mayor of, Mayor of Helsinki just raised about the urbanization. So that's the reason why uh, our Phnom Penh City, we focus on the updating of our master plan, uh, especially the land use master plan that we, we enlarge the green space from small size to, to very big size. So uh, this is very important, especially for the city of the developing country, that um, we have to fight the climate change uh, by uh, doing something that is already better for uh, if we compare to the current situation. And however, there's still a lot of projects that uh, we want to do and 
we need a lot of funding and um, I think that there are some issue that we need to discuss about the financial relation between the central government and the city level and how the city level could get access to the international funding. So this is also the issue that um, uh, we need to address uh, in the near, near future. I, I believe that for the cities in ASEAN, ASEAN country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vice Governor. And, and Desmond, please. I, I also want to add uh, a comment to what the mayor uh, had said, and I think it brings to question what do you really mean by integration of ESG mm. into investing and what do you mean by impact? And I think that this is an important subject for us to try and find some clarity about. And I, I, I totally agree that at the end of the day, shouldn't all investments uh, be considered ESG consistent? Because why shouldn't any, uh, anything not be ESG compatible? But I think there is a very clear difference between what we mean by integrating ESG factors into the way in which funds are applied or invested with what is the real impact that is brought uh, to the economy or to the world, or planet and people. And when we think about that kind of thing, we try and define sustainable finance around that intentionality. Is it, has it got to do with the sustainability focus of that fund or that particular investment portfolio? Or does it have an impact investing uh, outcome that is in mind? And that, that uh, is the space that we try and wrap sustainable finance around. Uh, and it's a careful space. It's very carefully deliberated and curated because obviously nobody wants to be accused of greenwash uh, if you get some of this taxonomy and classifications wrong. Yeah, and Desmond, it seems to me that you're saying something very important about the outcomes and how the proceeds are used. And if I could summarize it, you're talking about types of investment that produce positive externalities as well as internality. So it's the external rate of return, not the just the internal rate of return that you're measuring. So it's all of the environmental, social, physical, spatial, uh, and broader economic benefits. And you're also then talking about co-benefits, aren't you? Investments that have the effect they're supposed to have, but also create other benefits that are then publicly shared, for example, in a place or a space or in a transport system. And it seems to me that's what you're getting at. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So there is that intentionality element that's important. And there's the additionality that uh, we're talking about in terms of what else do you bring into this equation as a result of that sustainable investing that you're putting into this space? Great, very good. Now, our audience have been very busy writing questions for you. We're going to try and tackle some of those now. Just going to check with um, the team here. The clock that's on the screen tells me we're finishing in 23 minutes, but I think we're finishing in 31 minutes. Can somebody either uh, give me the right answer or change what the clock says uh, on the screen? Um, there's another poll up, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, which is, is the growth of sustainable finance a new opportunity for cities? Yes, no, or maybe. So far, 76% of you say, yes, it is. Now, let's go to the Q&A. Very good questions are coming in here. So um, we're going to start with Eugene, if we may. One of our um, delegates has asked the question, um, in your view, what is the importance of defining a green project or a, a project that is about cloud. What is, it, what is the difference that defining it in that way makes? Well, I think it, this goes a little bit to what Desmond was talking about, about tapping yeah. that investor base that is intentionally focused on you know, green opportunities and, and has um, you know, allocated capital for, that, um, for that, those purposes. And I think it does create some new... Um, uh, I guess, dimensions for us to monitor as a rating agency, because obviously when we think about um, green finance, green projects, and green bonds, uh, it does uh, require us to look a little bit more closely at you know, use of proceeds, and when we monitor those from a, um, from a green bond perspective, um, that is a, a very new field that we're, that we're focused on developing. So um, there is a lot of benefit from that. I mean, I just we've talked about the, the growth in the... Um, the uh, green, sustainable, and you know, social bond market, um, that we expect to continue to grow. And so I think that is um, a very exciting opportunity and, and, and a reason why many projects are, are aiming for that, that green designation 
um, and something that we are trying increasingly to monitor. Great, Gene, thank you very much. That's a really good answer. Um, Desmond, if I may, next one for you. One of our delegates asked, what do you consider to be the benefits around all of the mandatory disclosures that uh, banks and other financial institutions now have to involve themselves in, such as TCFD and the emerging TNFD? This is where financial institutions have to disclose what they're doing and what impact it's having in relation to climate. Do you see that there's a benefit in all of that? And if so, what is it? Well, I think one of the biggest challenges that we have in moving this whole ESG and sustainable finance forward is the fact that data, first of all, is, uh, is so untidy, it's not clean, it's not verifiable, and it's not even obligatory for, for, for many jurisdictions. And so the first thing that we all need to do in order to try and move this space is to at least have some kind of mandated basic disclosure uh, against certain international standards that are consistent across the field so that there is some kind of reference point, some kind of benchmarking that can be done. And with that kind of disclosure also, an ability to verify that this is indeed accurate and, and, and valid. And if we can do that, and there is no reason why we should not try, it's not, it's not easy, but there is no reason why we should not try to move forward in this space because not that long ago, it's been only decades in, in the history of civilization that mm. we talked about financial disclosures. Mm. And if you can move financial disclosures to the kind of international uh, quality and standards that we expect and see today across uh, corporates and mm. uh, countries, then why not the ESG sets of data disclosures? Thank you very much, Desmond. Uh, Vice Governor, there's three or four questions here that I could put to you, but one of the questions says, shouldn't green finance be the other way around and it just be more expensive for people doing brown investments, polluting investments? Would it be better to use a system of penalties, not so much to incentivize what's green, but to penalize what's dirty and polluting? What do you think about that? Well, um I think that it is the um, it should be the political uh, level who should answer this. Uh, but for us, um, we have to make balance between uh, what we should give us incentive and what we should uh, penalize, mm. like activities. Uh, so far, at the city level, we uh, we look at the we are implementation level. So the central government they fix the policy. So then for our level, we do the implement implementation. But I think that in, uh, we, it has to go in do that both ways. I mean, we have to give a lot of incentive, but we, we have also to penalize the action uh, um, uh, uh, for the violation of the, of the regulation. So, uh, so far, we have, we have issued a lot of regulation, and we monitor and also we penalize uh, those who, who violate the, the regulation. So I hope that I could answer to, to your question. It's a very good answer, Vice Governor, but there's another one I'm going to ask you as well, if I may. So keep your microphone because somebody else says, do you think it's going to be helpful for cities to cooperate with each other to try to cross-finance or to raise funds together? So in this example, perhaps Phnom Penh would partner with uh, Singapore, for example, or might partner with uh, Kuala Lumpur to try to finance things together. Do you like that idea? I do like that, and we have all, uh, we have already been successful in doing that. You know, we we have one joint project with Paris, as we are the not a sister city, but we are the uh, friendship cities between Phnom Penh and Paris. So we elaborate one uh, project together, and we get the funding from EU. So that, that's why at the city level, we, are, we like to talk about the grants and technical assistance because as I just mentioned that we're not allowed to take the loan. So we could work uh, together with the uh, other city to elaborate the, for the grants from the international partners. And I like your idea if we could work like uh, Phnom Penh and with the other city that could uh, elaborate uh, something to do together, it would be great. And as you just mentioned, 
uh, to fight against climate change is not only it's not a task for the rich uh, country or the poor country because this is uh, we have only one planet that we have to move together. So rich country need to assist the developing country and rich city need to assist the poor country uh, city. That is the rule that we need to set, and I do agree with you. Thank you. Great. So, um, Mr. Vice Governor, you're open to invitations from other cities to come and work with you. Maybe even Helsinki, Mr. Mayor. Let's let's come back to that. Um, Isabel, there's a very big question here that several people have asked in one way or another, which is, what do you think cities need to do to prepare themselves to be more able to access this new suite of sustainable finances? If if you were talking to the vice governor or the mayor or any other city leader, what's the three or four things you'd tell them to do to be more ready, to be more able? Um, so I would suggest um, if they could, first of all, prepare themselves to give the longest possible visibility to the market and the investors on the direction of travel. Um, investors and capital likes that certainty. They like the visibility to, to longer-term vision. Uh, very few times investors are prepared to come in and do one ad hoc project and support a city or a municipality. They would like to invest in a long-term relationship. So, so that is critical. Second, consistency of regulations. Uh, it is absolutely critical that mayors and subnational governments avoid what we call policy flip-flopping, which is that when an administration changes hands, then suddenly the policies of the previous administration are abandoned. Mm. Um, we really, you know, we as investors like to see that certainty somewhat on what we could expect that market to provide in terms of regulatory environment, institutional governance, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the second point. Um, and the third point is um, to really uh, understand that leveraging their balance sheet is going to take many shapes and forms. Mm. Commercial financing, of course, is one aspect, but there are multiple other types of financing, right? Most financing in, in cities that we have supported today have some sort of a small participation by, by public sources. There's normally a public sector uh, associated infrastructure that requires to be built with public funds, uh, some of them with a small percentage of blended finance to leverage. Some governments, as you've seen, the ability to leverage taxes upfront, uh, to, to leverage cost upfront from property owners for a, for a, for a later on uh, tax uh, adjustment, for example, to prepay improvements to some of the, the, the green and climate investments that the city is doing. So there, there are many different ways, but my third recommendation would be to make sure that they look at this as a single group. They really need to have the ability and the knowledge to prioritize. Some investments, because of the nature of the public good, would necessarily need to be financed by public funds. Some could be financed partly by public, private, uh, partly by private. It is critical that the city governments understand that because when you bring private sector expertise and finance, those projects need to be structured in a way that the risk is actually allocated to the party that is best able to bear that risk. Mm. Uh, if that balance of risk sharing is absent, those uh, initiatives are surely going to fail. Uh, so my recommendation would be take as long as positive view of the market that you can have, avoid ad hoc one of projects, you know, look at sector developments, um, make sure that you are providing enough information on, on, on the consistent regulatory process and, and the governance system, et cetera, et cetera, and make sure that you, you have a balanced risk-sharing framework with the private sector. Uh, Isabel, this is a brilliant answer, if I may say. Thank you very much. So, one, visibility to the market. Two, political and policy consistency. Three, understanding the broad spectrum of financing uh, opportunities. And four, prioritizing the scarce public resources for the uh, transactions or activities that are least market uh, uh, available right now. That, I think, is what you said. Is that Absolutely. Fair? Right. Brilliant. Now, uh, we're coming back to you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much for voting in the fourth poll. 80% of you 
say the growth of sustainable finance is a new opportunity for cities. None of you say no, 20% say maybe. Um, I'm going to launch the fifth poll now. We look forward to your comments on that. Um, Mr. Mayor, there's two comments that have come in for you. A whole load of people are agreeing with you, with what you said. Yes. You know, why does this need to be a special kind of finance? Why isn't, you know, why isn't the banking sector doing it? And then other people are saying, yes, Mr. Mayor, why isn't traditional finance already doing this? And that's why, in a sense, there's a chicken and egg here. Some people are saying the market is not moving quick enough towards the, the pro-planet, pro-climate investments. Therefore, some action is needed. Why is it that not enough is already happening in the mainstream markets, Mr. Mayor? Well, a lot is already happening. For example, looking at the amount of investment uh, allocated to wind power, for example. That's a clear sign of the markets expecting another kind of society and adjusting their investment to that extent. But basically, I guess the market is not convinced yet of the political system's ability to create that new environment where the climate, uh, cl climate repercussions are, would be adequately priced in, in economic ac activities. And this is the task of political decision makers at the national level and, and at the city level, just to create that expectations, even if we cannot... Now, the national governments seem to have a hard time agreeing on, on the pricing of, of carbon emissions. But it would already be great if they could somehow convince the public about the eventual possibility of such an agreement in 10 years' time or 20 years' time. And that's the beauty of the financial market. Once that expectations is in there, then it already will steer the investors' investors' actions today. And basically, look at, 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 at the world's political leaders. They are not yet up to the task. But at least my, my optimistic assessment is that humanity is slowly moving in the right direction, at least. Well, very good, Mr. Mayor. That's a very good defense. This is going to be a very interesting debate, actually. I'd like to, to take this forward. Let me say thank you to the delegates, because you've sent in about 50 questions. And so we are working through them very diligently. I think we've covered about 10 of them already because some of them overlap. Um, Vice Governor, there's a question for you that simply asks you, if the sustainable finance was available to Phnom Penh, what are the things that you would prioritize for this kinds of investment? What would you want to invest in? Well, it is little bit tricky when you don't have i mean you don't have food and the question is that which one is more delicious delicious mm. i think that if it is available and for the cities um you know each year we have to do the um what we call investment plan mm. so as it is not available it's not since we did not integrate it into our our um our investment plan so if we could have the available uh sustainable financing uh projects we will put it into our i mean we will take into consideration for our priority project so infrastructure is still uh i mean a priority for the developing country like our city and even to fight against the climate change for example, to fight against the flooding, you know, so to fight against the flooding, uh, to avoid the future shock for our residents, we need to invest a lot on the infrastructure to fight against the, the flooding. So this is still a big priority. And second, second one is on the transportation. And the challenge is that the cost for transformation is very expensive. So uh, I, that's, I, that, that the reason why I believe that it is a long way to go, uh, but uh, we encourage other city to, to move forward, to take a step ahead, ahead, and then we will get the experience and the best practice from the other cities. So that's the reason why I come back to your idea that there should be a peer-to-peer, -peer, a city-to-city to share experience and to uh, communicate uh, further 
for, for this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor, you want to comment on that? Is it a similar or a different set of priorities for Helsinki? Well, I guess they are. I wouldn't dwell on, on minor differences. I guess it's, it, it, it is pretty similar everywhere. What I find more challenging is, is to have the correct analysis and data to, 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 to make correct decisions. Like, we all like green investments, but we should really concentrate the green investment where, the, where it's, it's, it's most useful. As my, my chief economist likes to point out, it, it's very nice to build cycle lanes with green technology. But if it's more expensive to build them with green technology, you might end up with one cycle lane instead of ten. And then the overall effect of that ambition would be negative on your, on your climate balance. So, and what even a, a city like Helsinki, I feel we lack a sort of a good understanding, a good cost-benefit analysis of where can we have the greatest impact mm. on, on, on combating climate change. And this relates to the point that Jean was making, I think, earlier about understanding what does sustainability really look like for you and then where do you need to invest. Now, panellists, I'm going to ask you, if you don't mind, we're going to do a quick fire round, short answers, and we'll try to get through 10 more questions, but very quick answers. So, uh, Jean, there's a question for you. Are you concerned that ESG is being used, as it were, as a disguise for greenwashing. How, do you wake up in the middle of the night worrying about greenwashing or not? I mean, I think inevitably uh, we need to be vigilant to instances where that does occur. I wouldn't say that um, it's a systemic issue right now, but uh, the, I, I think the market for uh, GSNS uh, bonds, for example, will continue to grow. And so inevitably, there is going to be a degree of compliance and non-compliance, uh, and there will be variance around that. So um, I, I think there's going to be um, some instances. I wouldn't say it's a huge issue. Um, the antidote to that is, is really going to be around monitoring and transparency and as, as something that we've talked about uh, a little bit on this panel already. Okay, monitoring and transparency are the key. Um, Desmond, there's a question here particularly about Singapore, and it says... Do you like the idea that the, of the hundred billion dollars that are being created in a kind of public-private development to finance some of Singapore's resilience to sea level rises? Do you like that as a model for how to finance things? I think it's a great idea. This whole framework that was developed to try and bring in that kind of long-term debt uh, construct mm. uh, to finance some of the future mitigation and adaptation measures that's needed to fight climate change, I think that's really quite the way to go. Great. Thank you very much. And then, uh, Vice Governor, there's a question here about intergenerational solidarity. And uh, that basically, the question is, are you worried that future generations will leave your city uh, if they don't see the current generations doing something about climate change? Well... I believe that we are doing a lot and um, and we are committed to do more. So I'm not worried about that. Thank you. Okay, good. You, the, very good. Um, Isabel, there's a question here. Rather than nation-based interventions, shouldn't there be an international organization responsible for regulating the financial system to tackle the global climate crisis? In other words, not quite an IFC or a World Bank, but something that's actually regulating the whole financial system to make sure that it finances what's needed here. What's your view? My, my view is no. I'm actually not in favor of overregulation. I prefer to let market forces work. And I think that through collaboration, there's been a lot that, that has been achieved. Uh, to give you an example, since we're talking about capital markets in some of the, the answers today, uh, we have been supporting over 15 uh, stock exchanges today, part of the UN Sustainability Stock Exchange Program, to precisely increase the disclosure of ESG, gender, etc. So I really don't support overregulation. I think that is much better uh, for all of us to empower the national entities and to, through collaboration and and uh, and and yes, yeah, support and co-development to be able to, to align the, the efforts at the national level. Right, thank you very much. And Mr. Mayor, there's a question here that says, 
Penalties don't, don't work. We've seen that with e-waste stipulations placed on large tech firms, for example, they'd rather pay the fines than change their behavior. Firstly, do you agree? And secondly, what can we do about that? Well, I, I mostly agree. The right level of regulation or penalty should be international agreements on environmental harm, environmental externalities. And the basic example of this would be carbon pricing. If we had a, an international government that were as rational as, as that of Singapore. Mm. Singapore seems to have the, the completely rational, intelligent government. <laughs> if Singapore were the whole planet, then they would already have established a carbon tax, and then we would not need to have this discussion. Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Now, we're just going to uh, uh, the poll. Um, we asked you what aspect of sustainable finance might be most useful for cities. 32 of you have voted. There's still time for more of you. So far, sustainable infrastructure bonds are winning, coming in ahead of supply chain finance, which is second, and then ESG-linked loans, which are third, along with green credit ratings, you'll be pleased to see, uh, Gene. So that's where we are with that. One more quick fire round, then we'll get to our, our last question. Um, the, uh, there's a question here, Mr. Mayor, I think this is a, a good one for you, that says, you know, there's, there's an issue here about how you define a city when you think about sustainability. Should it be just the core city? Is it a metropolitan area? Is it a big region? What's the right spatial unit for thinking about climate investment? Well, it seems to be the case that the nearer people are to each other, the more productive they are. So I would, I would take concentration as, as the key measure. And this is really, uh, as I said, the, the gold mine, since this is the way we create value. And against that value, we can then, as cities, borrow money for all these wonderful green investments. So all the cities sit on a kind of gold mine. Just let your city grow and you, you become, become wealthier and then can undertake all these investments. Let build structures where people can be near each other, and then they can become productive. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Isabel, one for you. Um, how, do, how do we reach, or how do we get green and sustainable financing to reach countries that are particularly polarized? And the questioner mentions Russia, but we don't only have to talk about Russia, but in countries where there's conflicts and dilemmas, is it more difficult? And can we do something to get more sustainable finance into the cities in those countries? It is more difficult, but it can be done, definitely. I think we are actually supporting many engagements across many countries that are to some extent polarized. Um, it, does, it does take longer. Um, my sense is that uh, if you manage expectations at, and, and are clear as to what this type of financing is going to achieve in terms of development outcomes, you're able to mobilize everyone and support the engagement. Second, you do need to have a way to monitor and to report. I think that is absolutely critical. You need to show examples of what works and what doesn't. Um, we, for example, have a target to have 100% of IFC's new investments to be fully Paris aligned by 2025, and we are reporting on an annual basis our progress. It can be done, it's more difficult, but it can be done and it needs to be done. Great, thank you very much indeed. Vice Governor, there's a question here about how does a city leader with a short-term mandate, maybe four years or eight years, how do you take initiatives that are a long-term initiative around sustainability? Is there a conflict between the short-term mandate and the long-term agenda? And how can you manage that as a city leader? Thank you, Greg. Uh, before I answer to the, this question, I, I would like to come back to your previous question. question. Sure. I think I misunderstand your question about the, uh, the next generation and the, uh, I think that if we don't do something now, uh, we could be blamed in the future because they are going to worry about the next, I mean, the future of the city. You know, uh, Phnom Penh is also a big city that we face a lot of challenge, including the consequence uh, from the climate change, uh, not only the drainage, pollution, a lot of things. So that's why I, I'm saying that uh, we are doing a lot of things as, as, as well and we are planning a lot of things for them. So not to be blamed in the future. 
So this is the effort that our city's leaders we are we are uh, working on. And uh, regarding your question, we have like me, I have only two mandate of four years, so mm -hmm. maximum eight years. That's the, the reason why we need to have the uh, roadmap, like we just adopted the sustainable uh, sustainable development road, roadmap for Phnom Penh. So it will take 20 years, 30 years, but uh, the ma our mandate is to make sure that we follow that roadmap. So as a city leaders, we should define the roadmap where we have to, where, where we want to go, and we have to divide into step. And in our mandate, we, mandate we would like to achieve uh, some of the step and leave other step for the next next mandate of the of the uh, leadership. So this is uh, uh, my question, to, uh, my answer to your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it chimes with the point that Isabel made about policy consistency, even when leadership changes. Two more questions, and then we'll wind up with our final question. Uh, Desmond, there's a question here, and I don't know what UBS's interest in this is, but do you think that Islamic finance has a role to play in the broader sustainable finance agenda? Again, I would say this whole Sharia finance that uh, I guess the question is alluding to, I think it definitely has a place in the, the Muslim countries. And I think a lot of that in terms of helping to develop the social and the community infrastructure, which is just as important as talking about the hard physical infrastructure, is, is vital. So we can't separate away the climate action that we want to see and the kind of mitigations that go into that from an ability to raise some of the standards or alleviate the poverty in some of these countries. And those social causes uh, are, are vital. And some of that Sharia uh, and Islamic uh, financing practices, which meet some of these outcomes and defined objectives, uh, are most relevant in those countries. Great, thank you very much indeed. And the last question from the delegates, and thank you for these amazing questions. Um, this is a good question, Gene. It says, how do you convince investors that with all of these different green bonds, ESG-linked loans, how do you actually convince investors that the proceeds are going to be used for sustainable development? Is there a trust gap or a credibility gap, and how do we overcome it? Well, I think that's what we're working on as a company, is trying to overcome that trust gap by providing more consistent and regular monitoring. I mean, again, when it comes to green bonds, this is something we're just starting out in. Uh, we have second party opinions on green bonds and sustainably, uh, sustainable financing in general. Um, and it only, it, it, we have a common methodology, which is really the, the foundation for uh, trying to bridge all the differences and different flavors of these types of instruments. Um, and just consistent monitoring and reporting on that is how we can uh, build a, a foundation of trust here. Okay, so transparency is that the absolute key. Now, the poll, thank you very much again, 41% said, Sustainable infrastructure funds is number one. ESG linked loans, number two. Supply chain finance, number three. Very interesting. The things that you think could be most useful for cities. We've got 20 seconds each to answer the question, how will we know if we're making progress on all of this? In two years' time, what do you hope to see to make real progress in this area? We start with Eugene. We come down to the mayor. 20 seconds. Sure. Um, well, the next two years are going to be really tough years for debt capital markets. So if we see sustainable finance continue to grow as a proportion of total bond issuance, which it has done so in the first half of this year, then I would say that um, we really are making progress and this is an asset class that's here to stay. Thank you very much. Desmond. I would say that apart from the cities, I think the corporate ecosystem needs to also play a role. And if we begin to see more, more corporate entities define their purpose not just in terms of financial outcomes, but in terms of the larger impact on community and on the environment, I think we're making great progress. Thank you very much. Vice Governor. So um, I think that in one or two years, we want to see the cities to have more access to the information and also to the uh, uh, financial uh, life, what we are talking today. Uh, and. I hope that we will be, there will be other platforms for the cities to learn more and to get more experience on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Isabel. 
Uh, so we measure outcomes both on, on uh, quantum of investment, but also development outcomes. Uh, so in terms of quantum of investment, um, as I mentioned, we've worked with 310 cities over the last 15 years. Over the last five years, 88% of all those investments contributed to positive climate outcomes. I would like to see that number increase substantially. In terms of development outcomes, we would like to see them related to the project and market-based, more wide, market-wide um, impact. So project-based impact on stakeholders, as some of our colleagues mentioned, the social fabric, the communities, and also more systemic outcomes that impact the market and our market making. Great, thank you very much. Mr. Mayor, the last word. I hope we will have observed a drop in investments in fossil burning technologies in energy production and transport. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with one second to go, please join me in thanking this amazing panel. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mayor Johanna Varatiainen, Ms. Isabel Chetidin, Vice Governor Non Puarot, Mr. Desmond Quek, Mr. Jean Fang, and not forgetting Dr. Martin for this insightful discussion. Special thanks to Professor Greg Clark for making it all come together so wonderfully. We have now come to the end of this session. May I invite Greg and our esteemed panelists to remain on stage for a group photo, please. For our audience members, Tea Break will be available for collection outside. You are welcome to visit the Smart Cities Expo, Expo Booth and Singapore Pavilion, which are open till 6pm daily. Do catch our next session, the WCS track on development, which begins in this room at 4.15 p.m. after a short break. Playbacks of this session will be available in our virtual conference, which will be starting from 10th August. Please scan the QR code on the screen for more information about the World City Summit 2022 virtual conference. Before you leave, please use the QR code or link to fill in our feedback form. Until our next session, thank you once again and goodbye.